It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. This week's podcast is brought to you by Audible. If you like audiobooks, then you need to check them out. They have audiobooks from leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. You can catch up on all the hot new books you've been meaning to read while on your daily commute with Audible. When I was young, my grandmother would record herself reading books onto tape and then email them to me, so I've always had a love for the audiobooks that Audible provides. Currently, I am listening to The Big Picture by Sean M. Carroll, one of several audiobooks by former Story Collider storytellers available there. And just for our listeners, Audible is offering a free 30-day trial membership. Go to audible.com slash collider today and start your free trial. A science story, huh? NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt, felt I right. Right. Yeah, I was so and I just happy. thought, well, I had figured it wow. out. I feel it was like that tall. golden moment because science was on my side. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. Our first story this week is from Brian Mackenwell. So it was recorded in November 2016 at Hackney House in London. Uh, so I was pretty nervous before the flight because I didn't want to be one of the people who threw up. And this flight had a bit of a reputation for that. Its, its nickname was the Vomit Comet. Although um, NASA, who run the flights, they don't like you to call it that. Uh, they did, however, give us uh, three top tips for getting sick on this flight. Uh, the first tip uh, is to remember that NASA is a publicly funded organization, so it has to get its supplies from the lowest bidder. So it is very, very important that you double check your sick bag has a bottom before you need to use it. <laughs> The second thing that uh, they, they, they sort of warned us about uh, had to do with why this flight was special. So uh, NASA used this plane to create short periods of weightlessness for uh, research and training purposes. And it does that by sort of going up and down and up and down and up and down. And at the up bits, the peaks of this, uh, basically everyone in the plane sort of gets flung upwards. Um, and and it, it sort of simulates uh, what it's like to be in space. And you get about 15 seconds of that. So if you get sick during that bit, the thing to remember is that uh, the vomit doesn't come out and sort of float there. The surface tension will make it stick to your face. Uh, <laughs> sort of like the world's most disgusting beard. So it's very important that you hold the bag all the way around your mouth if you do want to get sick. Uh, the third part, uh, the third tip of getting sick in this flight has to do with the the the, the bits where it pulls up, because it goes up and then down, and when it goes down, it has to pull back up. And in that pull-up phase, you get about two Gs, so you feel twice the weight. So uh, if you decide to get sick during that bit, uh, it's uh, very important that you remember the vomit is going to fall with twice the force as you were used to. Uh, so you have to hold the bag very tightly. Uh, um, <laughs> you can imagine how they came to learn all of these facts. Uh, but by the time I got out to the physical plane, uh, I wasn't nervous anymore. That's mostly because they give you an anti-nausea shot, which makes you feel real weird. Uh, you, you're kind of lightheaded and, and a bit like being drunk, but uh, the sort of level where you're quite good at pool. And the thing is, uh, once the plane takes off, then the adrenaline kicks in, and then all of a sudden uh, those side effects uh, 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 go away, and you can go back to worrying about getting sick again. Um, so... <laughs> The uh, next bit of my talk's pretty good. I wonder what it is. Hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that wasn't... <laughs> uh, I did learn it. Uh, 
that wasn't the most nerve wracking part of the uh, the whole experience for me. That had actually happened uh, the day before on the ground, and it was the inspection. And I want to be clear, I'm capitalizing the T and the I in that. Uh, this was when the pilots got a chance to uh, look at all the equipment that was being brought onto their plane, uh, because there was eight different teams, a hundred different research scientists of, of one kind or another, uh, wanting to do experiments in zero gravity. Um, and so there's all sorts of weird and wonderful equipment. And these two guys were responsible for the ultimate safety of everyone on that plane. So they had complete veto over everything that got brought on there, okay? And you had to show them that you were taking this seriously, okay? Uh, and sort of taking it seriously was the, the general theme of the whole week. Uh, the NASA flight operations crew who run the plane are, are, are fantastic, but they're, they're very clear that you're not on a jolly. Like, you're not supposed to go up there and have fun. These, these flights are actually quite expensive, and all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, was, were there on U.S. taxpayer dollars. Uh, so basically, they didn't want to hear anybody saying, wee, uh, <laughs> when we were when we were up there. And uh, these two pilots, uh, the inspection was sort of like that feeling times about a million. Um, so all of the teams, the eight teams, we all, uh, uh, the inspection happened in this sort of roped off part of uh, an aircraft hangar. And uh, each of the teams had two trestle tables and we had to lay out every single thing uh, that we were going to bring onto the plane. And then we all sort of stood around the edge, all 100 people uh, and waited for the pilots to turn up. And then when the pilots did turn up, I was actually quite pleased because they're exactly how you would like uh, US Air Force pilots to look. Uh, they were sort of wearing jumpsuits and, and they had close cropped hair and, and they were wearing sunglasses indoors. Uh, <laughs> but they had clipboards and, and, and they were serious. So they, they came over to our team, this sort of long table, um, uh, at the far end of the table and they just started at that end and was like, what's that? What's that? And our team leader, Tom, had to stand up in front of these 100 people and sort of justify every single nut and bolt that we brought with us. So it was around then that my stomach dropped uh, because I realized what I had done. Uh, I, was sitting, I was standing at the far end, and right in front of me on the table was the thing I had added to the inventory, uh, which was a Rubik's Cube. And I did that for no reason. Uh, <laughs> I, I sort of, I like a Rubik's Cube and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to get a picture of it floating in zero gravity, you know? Uh, maybe, get, maybe get a retweet from the official account. That'd be, that'd be cool, but I, I didn't in that moment think that those two guys would value that the same way I was valuing it. Um, so as they were working their way through, uh, I had to desperately try and think of a, an explanation that wasn't stupid. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I thought, well, we were allowed to have a mascot. So maybe I thought, oh, maybe, maybe I could justify this. This is, a, this, is, this is our mascot. It's a mascot. It's a mascot. Rubik's Cube, very common mascot. Um, uh, but th at that point, they had just finished interrogating the cuddly Peppa Pig. We were, that was our actual mascot. Um, and so I realized that, that, that uh, my, my Rubik's Cube had no justification. This, this, this was a completely unauthorized piece of whimsy uh, that I was... <laughs> bringing onto this plane. And so they got closer to it and closer, and uh, I got into sort of a cold panic sweat. Uh, I, I felt like uh, I was going to get sick uh, rather appropriately. And uh, they got closer and closer and closer, and then they got to the Rubik's Cube, and then they didn't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> Looking back, uh, I suspect it's because NASA is so full of nerds, there's probably uh, Rubik's Cubes all over the place. Uh, and, and they probably don't even notice it anymore. It's like furniture uh, is, is sort of my, my best uh, guess. So by the time I was actually on the plane, uh, the, the difficult part was sort, of, was sort of over for me. And uh, when we got out above the Gulf of Mexico, we had a, a short period of time to get into position, right, into our different areas of the, the, the Vomit Comet plane flight. And so um, uh, in order to indicate to all of the flight operations crew how seriously we were taking it, uh, as soon as we were given the okay, we, we, we took off our sort of seat belts, the sort of standard airplane seat belt things, as quickly and efficiently as we could, stood up as quickly and efficiently as we could, and walked in really efficient straight lines to our different uh, areas, uh, because, oh, we were taking it seriously, you know. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, actually, I was so worried about being sick. Not just because getting sick is the worst thing your body can do as part of its normal operations, uh, but uh, because getting sick seems sort of frivolous, I guess. <laughs> like, like, 
emotional or something. It's it's certainly not rational. Uh, it's sort of the, the physiological equivalent of going, wee! Uh, <laughs> but we went over to our area and we had a reasonably simple setup. One of us lay on the ground. The other team members sat around them reading off numbers from the uh, uh, tissue oximeters that we were testing. So I was uh, laying down the first time I experienced weightlessness. And it's a bit of a weird sort of uh, experience to, to explain. Uh, close as I can get is that it's, it's a bit like floating underwater, uh, except there's no water. Uh, but this means there's sort of no resistance uh, in the same way you get in water. Um, so when you thrash around or move, you, you sort of don't really move around that much. But if you do happen to hit something, you will ping off in a crazy direction. It's very easy uh, to completely lose control of where you're going. Um, I, I didn't get sick. You will be glad to know. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. I, I, this is, thank you. It's not, there's not many rooms you'll get an applause for that. <laughs> Uh, so I, I didn't get sick. One, one of our team did, but I won't embarrass Nick by telling you it was him. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't even a big deal when that happened because apparently it happens all the time. Um, uh, but a more interesting physiological sort of response happened during the flight. And that was as soon as the first peak hit, uh, everybody started laughing. Uh, and then throughout the rest of the flight, everybody was giggling and having fun and catching each other's eyes and going, oh my God, you know, because <laughs> we were floating. It's, Im it's impossible not to have fun. Um, and the flight operations crew were, were uh, sort of, I expect, knew that would happen because um, they got slightly relaxed about it once we were up there. And, uh, and, and the thing is, even though we all had fun, uh, the work still got done. And I think that's a mistake we often make, especially in science, is in confusing seriousness with solemnity. Like, you, you couldn't possibly be doing good work if you're having a nice time or, 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 or getting sick. Um, <laughs> and, and that's not true. And, and we all know it's not true. And if you asked anyone, they would say it's not true. But we all still act like it's true. Like, uh, you have to be stony-faced in order to be serious about something. Um, so... If that experience taught me anything, uh, it was how to throw up in zero gravity. But if it taught me a second thing, uh, it's that we should probably try and switch off the gravity a little bit more often. Uh, thank you. That was Brian McInwells. Brian is the public engagement officer at the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics. In his spare time, he acts and directs as part of an amateur dramatics group and co-writes the monthly audio drama podcast, Action Science Theater. He claims he has only made two children cry in the course of his public engagement career. To date. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. Our second story today is from Jess Tom. It was also recorded in November 2016 at Hackney House in London. Biscuit, biscuit, this is an adventure. I'm not going to stage dive. <laughs> I mean, I can't promise that. <laughs> Front row, I'm sure you've got me. <laughs> biscuit, picture of cats. Hello, biscuit. I'm Jess. Biscuit, I'm an artist. Biscuit, a writer and a part-time superhero. Biscuit, head of cats. Biscuit, I also have a Tourette syndrome. Biscuit, which is a neurological condition. Biscuit, that means I make uh, noises and movements I can't control. Biscuit, called ticks. Beans. They're not called beans. <laughs> <laughs> salad or salad. <laughs> biscuit, hedgehog, biscuit. I'm going to describe myself briefly for anyone who might find this useful. I'm a 19-year-old antelope. Okay. I'm going to try and describe myself. Biscuit. <laughs> I'm a 30-something white woman. Biscuit of average build with curly brown hair and a very cool wheelchair. Biscuit, cats. There's three things you need to know straight away. Biscuit, cats. Firstly, you're going to hear the word biscuit 
and hedgehog. <laughs> biscuit a lot in the next 10 minutes. Biscuit. Um, biscuit. Secondly, if I say something funny, you're absolutely allowed to laugh. Biscuit, in fact, it will be a bit odd if you don't. Biscuit. <laughs> biscuit. Finally, several times a day, my ticks intensify. Biscuit. Hello, phone. It, it's, it's your mother checking up on you. <laughs> I mean, it might be. <laughs> biscuit, hedgehog, biscuit, cats, biscuit. Several times a day, my tics intensify and I completely lose control of my body and speech. Biscuit, these episodes, which I call ticking fits, look seizure like and need similar management. Biscuit, cats, um, if this happens while I'm talking, biscuit, entertain yourselves with a penguin. No, you don't have to do that, don't worry. <laughs> biscuit, biscuit, I mean, you can try. <laughs> biscuit. My support worker will come and help me and Liz will take over with that penguin. <laughs> biscuit, hedgehog, biscuit. Tourette's is one of the most frequently misunderstood conditions on the planet. Biscuit, lots of people have heard of it, but most of what they know is based on myths and stereotypes. Biscuit, so I thought I'd get some of a, f- a few of those out of the way first. Biscuit, swearing, fuck it. <laughs> it's often characterised, biscuit, as the swearing disease. Fuck a sheep. (laughs) In fact, only 10% of people with Tourette's have obscene tics. Fuck them. I am one of them. Biscuit. (laughs) Biscuit, but even so, I'm as likely to shout about domestic appliances, dinosaurs, or B-list celebrities as I am to swear. Biscuit. It isn't a rare condition. It's estimated to affect 300,000 people in the UK. Biscuit. But it's on a spectrum. So it affects each person differently. Some people's tics are barely noticeable. Biscuit, like mine. Biscuit. (laughs) Biscuit. While others will behave in a way that makes them stand out. Biscuit. It isn't just saying what's on your mind. Biscuit. I don't think about biscuits. Biscuit. Nearly as much as I talk about them. Biscuit. 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 It's a neurological condition, not a mental health disorder, and it's not caused by bad parenting, nervousness, biscuit, or demonic possession, biscuit. So what is it, biscuit? My favourite description, biscuit, comes from the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine, biscuit, (laughs) da-da, biscuit. You always introduce a handbook with a da-da, (laughs) da-da, biscuit, biscuit. It describes Tourette's as irrepressible, biscuit, explosive, occasionally obscene, verbal ejaculations and gestures, biscuit. It goes on. There may be a witty, innovatory, phantasmagoric picture with mimicry, antics, and playfulness. Biscuit. And that's the Tourette's I know. Biscuit. I'd like to play a quick game. Biscuit. So turn to the person next to you and say hello. Biscuit. Now, stare into their eyes and try not to blink for as long as possible. Biscuit. Cats. Hedgehog. Biscuit, cats. Hedgehog, biscuit. Biscuit. Have we got any winners? Biscuit, hedgehog, biscuit. Have we got any winners? Round of applause for all our non blinking champions. Biscuit. I often use blinking, biscuit, as a way of explaining to children what ticks feel like. Biscuit, I remember a lovely conversation with a child at work. Biscuit, we were sitting in the garden near a pond. Splash! That's Theresa May falling in. Okay. <laughs> that didn't happen in the real story. <laughs> biscuit, hedgehog, biscuit, biscuit. Shaded by a green canopy, biscuit. Patches of sunlight made their way through the leaves. Biscuit. The girl I was with was seven. And together, we were looking into the water. Biscuit. Discussing what might live beneath the surface. Biscuit. I'd explained Tourette's to her before. Biscuit. Like I have to lots of children. Biscuit. Biscuit. But she asked what ticks felt like. Biscuit. So I asked what her body did all the time without her noticing. Biscuit. She couldn't think of anything. Biscuit. So I pointed out how she blinked. Biscuit. 
She laughed and said, Biscuit, if I don't blink, it hurts. I have to blink. Biscuit, I said that's a bit like how it feels for me if I don't move or make a noise. Biscuit, she suggested we had a no blinking competition. Biscuit, carefully pointing out that biscuits were okay. Biscuit, biscuit. We sat on the ground near the pond and stared at each other. Biscuit. London's never felt so peaceful. Biscuit. She won. <laughs> Biscuit. <laughs> Biscuit. Ticks will feel slightly different to each person with Tourette's. Biscuit. Mine create a whole range of sensations. Biscuit. Like, like a bubble machine on a trampoline in inside, inside a porcupine's bum. I mean, that's not exactly how I'd describe it. <laughs> Biscuit. Biscuit, but my tics do often draw, it, draw my attention to the world around me in a way that I'd otherwise miss. Biscuit, biscuit, my bed was cold when I got in it. Biscuit, so I pulled the duvet tightly round me as I settled down to sleep. Biscuit, I hadn't closed the blind. Biscuit, but I didn't want to leave my slowly warming bed. <laughs> so I lay looking at the familiar scene outside my window. Biscuit. Biscuit. It was a blustery autumnal night. Biscuit. The first since the seasons had changed. Biscuit. My ticks were instantly drawn to the wave-like movements of the trees outside. Biscuit. You're waving like the sea trees. Biscuit. Are you a large tree or a sea anemone? Biscuit. Trees. The squirrels are so lucky you've given them whitewater rafting lessons. It's an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Biscuit, hedgehog. Biscuit. The branches, still leafy, undulated and swirled. Biscuit. I drifted off to sleep, watching them, shouting sporadically. Biscuit. Soon, they'll lose their leaves and stop waving like the ocean. Biscuit. And if it wasn't for Tourette's, this seasonal shift would probably have passed me by. Biscuit. Biscuit. Hedgehog. Biscuit. So you probably guessed it by now, Biscuit. But if my story has one take-home message, Biscuit, it's that you never put to a... Theresa May in a colander. <laughs> that 19% that of all orgasms look great in grayscale. <laughs> and, and that trigonometry is the biggest adventure anyone can have on a Thursday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was just Tom. Jess is co-founder of Tourette's Hero and may or may not lead a secret double life as a superhero. Artist, playworker, and expert fundraiser, Jess currently helps coordinate a large play project in South London. Jess has had tics since she was a child, but wasn't diagnosed with Tourette's until she was in her 20s. With some encouragement from her friends, Jess decided to turn her tics into a source of imaginative creativity, and the Tourette's Hero project was born. If you enjoyed today's story or a fan of the podcast, please consider writing us a review on iTunes. It's a great way to help new listeners find the podcast, and we love sharing these stories. We're also grateful for the support of the Simons Foundation, who helped make this all possible. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Shane Hanlon, Rosie Waldron, Cassie Soliday, Nissa Greenberg, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Zoe Saunders, and the theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Hackney House for hosting the show, to the British Science Association for being amazing partners, and to almost all airplanes for not inducing nausea. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.